it is. Okay, so I'm Pat Grubel from Los Alamos National Laboratory, and I'm going to talk about Agile. And again, this is our citation slide. So this talk is about Agile, and just a second, <laughs> with an emphasis on small teams. And um, hang on a second, I'm sorry. First, I'll go over some of the things that affect small teams to emphasize the importance of applying agile methodologies to help manage some of the challenges associated with small teams. I'll explain agile and agile workflows. We'll get familiar with some of the common terminology and approaches, and then I'll talk about some of the tools that are available to help you uh, starting these methodologies and make, um, give you more productivity for your small team. Small scientific software teams are usually composed of one or two senior faculty or uh, PIs and several junior members who may be students or postdocs or other junior staff. And stability of the project usually depends on the senior staff, while the junior staff tend to have a limited time on the project. They may be graduating or transitioning to other roles in their career. Senior staff have the vision for the project and know the overall goals, but they don't usually do the coding. And the junior staff usually does the coding but are and are entrenched in the details. But again, uh, they may transition in and out of the project frequently. Although this talk emphasizes the small team, large teams are many times composed of smaller teams. So the methods can be applied, keeping in mind that extra interactions with the larger team or with other sub teams. There are many challenges that small teams have. They may be they may have informal structure and they less clearly defined processes. Processes that work for large teams in places such as industry and enterprise systems may not work well for small teams. In small teams, there's often a flux of membership, especially among the junior members who are most familiar with the details. Many of the junior members have other items to focus on, such as graduation requirements or publishing. Uh, small teams, small team membership may be in constant flux. There need to be processes for newcomers to ramp up quickly in several areas, such as the, con um, the details of the concepts and the tools that are used for that project. Also, upon leaving, there is a need to make sure the work they have done is retained and that their knowledge is handed on to other team members. The team member life cycle demonstrates the importance of procedures and checklists for onboarding, policies for continuing work, and checklists for and procedures for departing members. The first phase for any new member is initiation and setup. Then there is a ramp up phase. It can be quite extensive depending on the team member's experience, as well as the processes required and how well those processes are defined for the new member. The next phases are active work involving planning and actual work. Even in these areas, it helps to have clearly defined policies and to ensure that they are followed and updated as needed. If the team member is a student, postdoc or has some type of term appointment, the time period is usually known, and that makes it easier to plan for their departure. So it's important to have processes in place to ensure the transfer that their contributions are preserved and used by the project. And once a replacement is appointed or any time a new member joins the team, this cycle is repeated. There may be a variety of checklists for a project. Here's an example, um, a snippet from an onboarding checklist for developers joining the Trolinos project. And I, if you wanna look at it in more detail, you can look at the site that's on this slide. Uh, checklists, checklists are essentially to-do lists and can be improved by adding items or updating them as they are discovered either missing or some part of the information is, uh, has changed. And you can do that as you are onboarding someone and you discover this. Um, there are, can be a variety of checklists. Think about what kind of checklists your team needs. 
Maybe you need a checklist for code review or um, some types of some part of your development process or even team behavior documentation. Think about the checklist that that would help you and start developing them. The development tools from the SDK project is a collection of libraries and tools that are um, from independent projects, but they're specifically targeted to address performance at scale. So these policies are used across the community to ensure uh, consistency. Um, we show the link here because you could look at these policies and see what would help in keeping your project consistent um, during development. So checklists and policies can be effective in mitigating the challenges that teams have. Now I'm going to talk about what Agile is. So what is Agile and what does it, how, why does it work for small research teams in the scientific environments? In these types of environments, your work pattern may be disrupted by results. Your focus may need to change to presenting new results or publishing or even making changes to the model. Heavyweight techniques may not be flexible enough for these changes, but in a small team, you can adopt processes that are beneficial for your team and focus on areas that you need to. You may need to focus on productivity or sustainability of the software. Heavyweight approaches do not usually fit the scientific domain well. For a small team, using Agile allows the team to choose the processes that are beneficial and can adapt them to their needs. So the main idea is to choose what helps your team. Now we will talk about Agile and what it is not. It is it not a I'm sorry, it is not a traditional software development cycle. It doesn't have phases that a traditional model has. Sometimes Agile is described as being Scrum. Scrum is widely used in the enterprise communities to help teams work together. Scrum is Agile, but Agile is not only Scrum, much like a square is a rectangle, but not all rectangles are squares. So, um, and then uh, Scrum and scientific teams hasn't really been explored that much. But we do use uh, Kanbans, and they can be seen as a tool to aid agile methodologies. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. More information about what agile is can be found in the manifesto for agile at agilemanifesto.org. I'll go through some of the principles, but don't have the time to cover them all. There are four critical components, however, which are shown above the red box. Now, if you um, look at the, what's in the red box, um, you notice that it says that although the principles on the left are more important than the one, are usually more important than the ones on the right. So we emphasize the ones on the left over the ones on the right. So let's read, um, let's go over these principles. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We look at working software over comprehensive documentation. Now that doesn't mean that documentation isn't important. It is important, but working software does take emphasis over it. So don't use it as an excuse not to do documentation or have good documentation. But the most important thing is that your software is working. Also, there's customer collaboration over contract negotiation and responding to change over following a plan. In other words, be, you can be flexible. Well, <clears throat> so look over the manifesto and read the 12 principles for deeper understanding. We'll go through a few of them now. The 12 principles are listed in the next two slides. I don't have time to go into all of them on detail, but you should read them as you can. Here are some important items that are highlighted in red. So let's go th through the first two. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. 
Agile actually focuses on this principle because a lot of heavyweight life cycle software processes use a long time for developing and testing before delivering the software. And then when the cycle is at that point, they deliver software that may have um, where the requirements or even the target environments have changed. Then the developers have to fit the changes in in a very quick time to satisfy the needs of the stakeholders. So Agile tries to circumvent this by having early and regular delivery, perhaps including changes that come up during the development process. The second principle is to welcome changing requirements even late in development. Now this doesn't mean that a stakeholder can change or add new requirements every day or hold on to requirements and pile them up late in the development. But there should be a way to be flexible and be able to offer development for important changing requirements. Here are the remaining principles with some important ideas highlighted again, such as having processes that promote sustainable development and maintaining a constant pace for stakeholders and developers. Uh, reflection on becoming more effective. Read through the 12 principles to get a deeper understanding, especially if that interests you. The principles are not meant to be hard and fast rules, but guides. Pick a practice or a few practices to try and use the ones that work for your team. Add them to your processes. It may be easier to get started with basic prin principles of Kanban and add the practices as you can and build them incrementally. So here is a basic Kanban board. I like to think of it as an organized to-do list with status, maybe divided or labeled by sub-projects. Basically, every project has tasks that needs to be done and are in various stages, such as shown in the columns here. Items that are backlogged, uh, those that are ready to develop, those that are actually in progress of development, and then those that are completed. You may have other columns, such as maybe you have reviewed, in review or blocked items. Or if you're a student, maybe you have some, a column called waiting on advisor. You can be as creative as you want. Uh, design the Kanban however works well for you and your team. There are basic principles that you should follow for Kanban. An important principle is to limit the number of tasks that are currently being worked on. This limits the cost of context switching for your team members. Each team needs to determine the number of tasks that can be active or in progress. A good rule is to have two times the number of team members minus one. Kanban is good at exposing bottlenecks. If you have a column like waiting for review or block that is full, you can easily see the bottleneck is not getting timely feedback from your collaboration, collaborators or maybe for a student from your advisor. Once a bottleneck is identified, the team can work on fixing the processes that affect it. Kanban avoids a deadline approach, more common in Scrum. Deadlines are dealt with in other ways. Kanban is a nice way to manage tasks and view progress of the project to ensure steady progress and improve productivity. Kanban can also be used to organize your personal life, and or your personal tasks for work projects. You can dive deeply into the subject for personal Kanban in this book, or you can go to the article on our Better Scientific Software website, bssw.io, which David mentioned earlier. The article has links to a few quick references for personal Kanban and points to some of the tools that I'll talk about in the next slide. It also has other helpful articles for productivity for both teams and individuals. I use Kanban to manage my work, where I have to manage work on several different projects. I can see the progress of my tasks and ease the cost of the unavoidable context switch. You can also use personal Kanbans for, your ma for managing your personal life, and you can share your Kanban with uh, team members or family members. Let's look at Kanban tools. So here we show some basic tom Kanban tools. Um, you can even start out with a blackboard or a whiteboard uh, with um, post-it notes. 
like in this example. And, and then you can transfer it to one of the um, cloud-based ones if you want to. Uh, there's many, there's Trello, Jira, GitHub uh, issues and the project boards associated, associated with GitHub or GitLab. And there are many more. Um, Trello is a free software. It's rather useful because you can update it from a browser or your smartphone or an iPad. So you could update it or view it from anywhere. And you can have different boards for different contexts. It's also very effective for uh, people who are split on multiple projects, like I was telling you I do. So the big question is, how many tasks should I have on my board? I started with just a few tasks for each of my projects and have increased them over time. I think I have around five columns and 40 or so tasks with labels for each of my projects. Um, if you add too many tasks to the board, it can become like a packed highway. The traffic doesn't flow up well. So you should start simple and add as you go. Make sure you update it and consult the board often. You may be very enthusiastic at the beginning, and then sometimes you lose interest. That happens to me. It's happened even to my teams. Um, when it happens, you can, it's OK. You can come back to it and start up again. It does help to make a habit of consulting the board regularly. I, In my personal project Kanban, I have a today um, column, and I move things in and out so I can kind of keep track of what I'm going to do that day. And then I consult my other columns regularly. The board helps you keep in mind how well your team is doing, what team members are working on, and what the bottlenecks are. It also helps with reflection and retrospection and improves productivity. If you have a Kanban board, you will have a clear picture of your time. It helps you to focus on your work and if a new task comes up, you can determine if you have the bandwidth to work on it or what you might need to put on the back burner to give you that time. This can set up a good discussion with uh, your team members or your advisor or supervisor. And it can also help you to negotiate what time should be spent on the new task or whether that task can even be added. If you were to come up with your own new task that you're really excited and enthusiastic about, um, you can look, look at your Kanban and help plan uh, how you put it in. And also then you can maybe use that tool to help you with negotiation with either your supervisor or advisor or other team members. So let's talk about Kanban, um, how we can build on Kanban. The focus should be on solving issues. One helpful way is to have regular short stand-up meetings where team members can report on progress. You can have planning meetings, retrospective meetings on what has gone well or what hasn't gone so well. Now, we will look at epic story and tasks. The concept of epic story and task has worked well for both research teams and enterprise teams. The idea of epic story task is that you start with a high level with the high level requirements and they are broken down into lower levels when you need to. This is done in that manner because a lot of time might otherwise be spent in defining the low level requirements and those become outdated when the task actually begins and that wastes time. So the idea is to spend that type of effort closer to the start date of the task. So epics are very high level objectives and you refine epics, you will have stories. And then epics usually have several stories and those stories can be broken down into ta several tasks in order to complete a story. Once you have completed all the tasks in a story, those are checked off. And once all the stories in an epic are done, your epic is complete. One way to define epics and stories is to have user stories. User user stories are something to help you, your customer and team understand the requirements and processes. It helps the development team and stakeholders to understand the overall process. As an example of a uh, story, you might say, as a team lead, I want to learn Kanban in order to manage my team better. 
the user story would be important for adding productivity of the team. The stories are used to improve communication and elicit information about the requirements from the stakeholders and also to help the team to fulfill goals of the project. And here's some examples that uh, go along with our heat example in our hands on uh, uh, for developers. So you might look at th these types of stories and think about um, what you would need to add for your um, epic and stories. So epic. <laughs> so epic is derived from the user stories. It can help you with refactoring code, enhanced modularity, those types of things. Here is a sample of Kanban board from the Collegeville organization. Um, Explore this example. It's a real world example. See how they use Kanban and see if some of their ideas can help you to manage your project. Uh, it might give you some ideas for your Kanban board if you have if you want to start one up. So I just wanted to mention GitHub or uh, GitLab, uh, wherever you might have a repository for software development. Uh, since many projects use GitHub for development, it's easy to use the project boards um, on, on GitHub as a Kanban. Um, they're basic Kanban boards, and they give you the ability to map the submitted issues in your repository to columns on the project board. It doesn't have to all the features that some of the other tools have, but it's quite easy to use. And like I said, it's available on the same site where you keep your projects. In fact, I was introduced to Kanban through GitHub project boards. And I, as I mentioned, I actually organized my personal work on um, a GitHub project board. And uh, several of my projects have GitHub project boards that are used for Kanban. So it lacks some of the more important um, advanced features, like there aren't dependencies between issues uh, but you can reference an issue uh, from another issue. And it doesn't have advanced notification schemes or custom fields. You can create custom labels. As I said, I create labels for each of my projects and my personal work board. And then I can actually filter the display so I can look at just one project at a time if I want to. So there are ways to, to use it. And it's like I said, again, it's good because sometimes you can use it on the same area where you do your software development. Another thing you can look at on the, um, is the A-Team tools that where we have a collection of resources for applying some lightweight agile practices. We invite you to explore that site. And another reference that we have is the um, books here. Um, these have all been highly recommended resources for helping with your uh, productivity and your agile workflows.